Great question. Where did Elijah go? The question was asked by a number of people. But I want to start with uh, something that Jesus told us in Luke chapter 16. Jesus told of the rich man and Lazarus. People argue whether that's a parable or a true story. Well, a parable and a true story are not opposites. <laughs> it's not an either or. A parable is simply an illustration told to uh, bring up, to teach a point. And it can as easily be uh, a true story of living persons, a true story of dead persons, or a hypothetical situation. Question really is, does the picture that Jesus paints describe truth? And it's almost frightening to think that somebody would even ask that question. Would Jesus ever tell us something that did not reflect truth? Remember that God cannot lie. In Luke chapter 16, the 19th verse says that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. And the rich man also died and was buried. There's a great contrast between those two. We won't go into that tonight. But looking at the point of death, where did they go? Particularly, we're concerned with where Lazarus went. Regarding Elijah, we find that record in 2 Kings chapter 2. In verse number 11, it came to pass, as they still went on, Elijah and Elisha crossing over the Jordan River. And they talked that, behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire and parted them both asunder. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. And Elisha saw it, and he cried, My father, my father, the chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof. And he saw him no more. And he took hold of his own clothes and rent them in two pieces. The record of Lazarus and of Elijah suggests for us proof for the existence of heaven. That there is life after death. There is a place of consciousness, and the Bible abounds with such evidence. Let's consider the evidence from uh, several different perspectives. Those who went up to heaven, those who returned from heaven, and yes, there were several, and people who were given the privilege of looking into heaven, and there were several of those as well. Here in 2 Kings chapter 2, notice the scripture says that Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. The Bible describes or uses the word heaven to describe three different regions actually. There is the heaven as we speak of the birds flying in the heavens above us. That's just a few hundred feet. And then there is the heaven where the stars are and all the planets out in the gorgeous heavens of the nighttime. And then there's the heaven beyond that where God lives. Paul referred to that as the third heaven. When Elijah went up, where did he go? The scripture says he went up into heaven. I'm talking about into the realm of the spirits beyond the physical universe. Some of the people who were with Elisha said, let's go look for him. It may be that the Lord has taken him and dashed him on some rock someplace. Elisha said, don't go looking for him. It will be a fruitless effort. God took him to heaven. But they went and they spent three days looking for Elijah, and they didn't find him. Elisha knew that they wouldn't. He said, didn't I tell you not to go? He had seen where Elijah went. He had seen how he went. Chariots of fire and horses of fire don't typically roam in that part of the world. Now, that was something that came from God. And he went up and out of sight, in a whirlwind. Elisha knew that. 
He didn't have any question where Elijah had gone. Let's look also at the record of Jesus. At the end of his record of the life of Jesus, Luke in chapter 24 of his record in verse number 51 says that while Jesus blessed them, he was parted from them and carried up into heaven. At a very early point here in our study, we have to determine in our own minds whether the Bible is a book of truth or a book of speculation. If God's word is truth, if the words spoken by Luke or written by Luke were inspired of God, God breathed, as Paul says. Then Jesus went up into heaven. Luke continued that record in the book of Acts. When he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel. They said, what are you looking up there for? He'll come again, just as you've seen him go. The angels were there with them confirming the fact that Jesus had gone up into heaven. In, in the record of the gospel account, back in chapter 24 of Luke, Luke continued, And they, that is the apostles, worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy because they knew where Jesus had gone. And they were continually in the temple praising and blessing God. It's not something that you'd expect them to do with their rational beings and they doubted seriously that Jesus had gone back into heaven. They watched him go up and disappear into a cloud. They beheld him. They looked steadfastly. They heard the angels speak of his going and his coming again. And they worshipped. In fact, as I mentioned, the angels even rebuked them for gazing, for looking. It was a fact. It happened. Don't stand there and wonder. Take a lesson from it and go on and live accordingly. What did they do? Because they believed that Jesus had gone into heaven, they continued daily praising God, worshiping him in the temple in the, in the city. So there were. there's a record of those who went up into heaven, and the, the Bible is consistent. And the Bible is proven to be the word of God. But let's look at the testimony of those who returned from heaven. Well, that's not, so, not something that we can expect to do. It's not something we can expect to see. These clearly were uh, unusual, abnormal events, miraculous events. Let's look at a few of them. There is the case of Samuel in 1 Samuel chapter 28. I want to read beginning with the third verse and down through several verses to see what happened here. Notice first that Samuel was dead. And he had been dead for quite some time when we pick up the record at this point. All Israel had lamented him and buried him in Ramah, his own city, and Saul had put away those that had familiar spirits and wizards out of the land. Then two different events, two different times, but time has passed. Samuel is dead and buried. Now there came a time when the Philistines gathered themselves together and came and pitched in Shunem, and Saul gathered all Israel together, and they pitched in Gilboa. They pitched in Gilboa. And when Saul saw the host of the Philistines, he was afraid, and his heart greatly trembled. And when he inquired of the Lord, the Lord answered him not, neither by dreams, nor by Urim, nor by prophets. So Saul was praying. God had departed from him. God was giving the kingdom over to David. Wasn't listening to or blessing Saul anymore. He continued to try to pray, but he wasn't getting an answer. <coughs> then Saul said to his servants, Find me a woman who has a familiar spirit so that I can go to her and inquire of her. And his servants said to him, Behold, there is a woman that has a familiar spirit at Endor. <coughs> some of this is superstition, and some of it, of course, is prophecy. Some of it is miraculous. Um, there were people, and always have been, I guess, in the world, certainly are today, those who believe in fortune tellers and seers who can communicate with the dead or tell us what's going on in the other world or what's going to happen in the future. And it's, um, it's a learned skill, a trick, 
uh, and say just enough that make people think that, uh, you know, it's, it's really true. But in this particular, and that's probably where Saul was, though it's possible that Saul had known that God had at times um, allowed people to know certain things. And so certainly he had sent prophets into the world and told the people his will. But Saul, apparently uh, trying to uh, control the flow of information and the influence over the people, had outlawed all of that. But here on this occasion, he disguised himself. He put on other clothes. Didn't look like a king. He went, and two men with him, they came to the woman at the nighttime and said, I, I pray you divine unto me by the familiar spirit and bring me uh, him up whom I shall name unto thee. And the woman said, well, you know, I can't do that. Saul has, has uh, made that illegal, put us all out of the land, so we can't do that. Uh, if, if you... Uh, Try to make me do that, then you're causing my death. You're bringing me to death. In verse 10, Saul swore to her by the Lord, saying, As the Lord lives, there shall no punishment happen to thee for this thing. And then the woman said, Well, who do you want me to bring up? And he said, Samuel. But when she saw Samuel, she cried with a loud voice. And she spoke to Saul and said, You've deceived me. You are Saul. She was a fake. She wasn't able to bring people back from the dead. That's why she was shocked and why she cried out with a loud voice and how she knew that this was Saul because God sent Samuel back with a message to Saul. The Bible says that Samuel came back from the uh, tomb, or from the grave, from the world beyond. And... Uh, <coughs> You know, if, if that didn't happen, then we're going to have to show evidence to the contrary. The record continues in the 13th verse of 1 Samuel chapter 28. And it says, The king said to her, Be not afraid. What did you see? And she said, I, she said to Saul, I saw gods ascending out of the earth. And he said to her, What form is he of? And she said, An old man comes up. He's covered with a mantle. And Saul perceived that it was Samuel, and he stopped and uh, stooped his face to the ground and bowed himself. Well, the record goes on to the conversation of what Samuel told him, but the Bible says that Samuel came back from somewhere. He had died, and they had buried him quite some time past, and now he comes back from where his body was. He came up out of the ground. Where had Samuel been? And how is it that he's alive now and able to speak and move about? When uh, we look at the New Testament, we have another Lazarus. This is one that uh, Jesus raised from the dead in John chapter 11 is the record. You remember the story how word had come to him that his friend Lazarus was sick and he stayed where he was for four days. And uh, then he said, well, let's go raise him up. His disciples didn't want him to go back into that area because Herod was trying to kill him. But he said, it's necessary that we go. And we'll see as we look at the record why it was necessary. But when Jesus came to the place, he found that Lazarus' body had lain in the grave for four days already. And Jesus cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he that was dead came forth bound, hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was bound about with a napkin, and Jesus said, loose him and let him go. Here's the reason that Jesus waited four days. Verse 45 says, that many of the Jews which came to Mary and had seen the things which Jesus did, believed on him. He was giving evidence of his own identity as the Son of God, his own ability to save men from all of the things that disturb us, upset us, and uh, showing us uh, in all of his healings of sick and crippled people. He was illustrating his ability also to cure our spirits from sin. But Lazarus came back from the dead. And he came back 
alive and well and continued to live for some time with his sisters. Later on in the last week of Jesus' life, there were those who were trying to kill Jesus and they said, let's kill Lazarus also because many people will believe in Jesus even if he's dead because Lazarus is here walking around and everybody knows that he was dead. Jesus himself is another one, of course, who returned from the dead. When the ladies went to the tomb on the, the day of the uh, third day after his death, on the first day of the week, they saw the tomb empty, and the angels said, Don't be afraid. You're seeking Jesus of Nazareth, which was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. Behold the place where they laid him. But go tell his disciples. He will go before you into Galilee, and you'll see him there just as he said to you. We find that record in the first nine verses of Matthew 28, the first nine verses of Mark 16, the first 12 verses of Luke 24, and the first 18 verses of John chapter 20. It was a significant event. It was an important event. And so it's recorded at, in detail by all four of the writers. It's what Peter preached on the day of Pentecost. Acts chapter 2 and verse 32. This Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we all are witnesses. Now if somebody comes to you and says, I witnessed an event, I saw it with my own eyes, and you weren't there. You don't know. Then you have to ask yourself, is his tale believable? And is he trustworthy? Is he a believable person? And so when we study the words that Peter spoke, we see the consistency of report from numerous writers in the scriptures. And, by the way, many other writers not in the Bible, early writers of the time, were reporting the same thing. And then when we look at the life of Peter, we see him to be a human being just like us. He made his mistakes, but he always came back to God, and he was exalted by God as an evangelist and an apostle. And he was appointed by the church as an elder in the church. So here was a man of character, and he said that I'm a witness of the resurrection of Jesus. The apostle Paul also was allowed to see Jesus in a different form and this is uh, a little bit more to our point. In 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 15, well, that's not the verse I wanted to think of, but let's look at that one. In 1 Corinthians 15, Paul tells us in the first eight verses uh, that we ought to hold on to what he preached. And why? Because it's the truth. He said, I preached the gospel, and the gospel is what saves you, and here's what I preached that Jesus Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures, and that, he was, and that he was seen by Cephas, that is Peter, and then by all the apostles. And after that, about 500 brethren at once, many of them are still alive, Paul said at the time he wrote. Some of them weren't. And then he was seen of James, and then of all the apostles again, and last of all, he was seen by me as one born out of due time. Paul had seen the resurrected Jesus. Where did he do that? He saw him on the road to Damascus. In a vision, Jesus appeared out of heaven and uh, spoke to Paul. And then later Paul talks about having been caught up into the third heaven and seen things. We'll look at that again in just a moment. In Matthew chapter 17, the first five verses, we see Moses and Elijah returned from somewhere. They were alive, and they were talking with Jesus. And Peter and James and John saw it and heard it. And they thought it was a good thing. They wanted to stay there and enjoy that. Where, where have they been? Where did they come from? Why are they alive and talking and moving about? It's hard to argue against life beyond the grave when we see this kind of evidence. We see a record of people going directly up into heaven. We see a record of people coming back from heaven. But there's also the record of some here on earth who were, enabled, who were uh, permitted to look into heaven, 
even while they stood on solid ground. The first, of course, would, I guess, be Jesus, maybe not while he stood here, but he was there before he came here. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. Where's God? God's in heaven. Jesus was there with him. He had seen heaven with his own eyes. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus had seen heaven. He knew what he was talking about, and he came and told us what he had seen. In Luke chapter 16, that record of a uh, rich man and Lazarus, he's describing something that he knew from first ex firsthand experience the place of uh, the righteous, the paradise, and then the place of suffering of the wicked, and then the great gulf between. In uh, Acts chapter 7, we read of Stephen, who was on trial for preaching the name of Jesus. And as they were stoning him, <coughs> Luke tells us that he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God, and Jesus standing on the right hand of God. And he said... Behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. And uh, that, of course, was exactly why they were stoning him. They didn't want to hear that. They didn't believe that. They wouldn't have any reason not to believe it other than their prejudice, other than their own past experience. Things like that just don't happen in our world. But here was God moving in that day in fulfillment of prophecies working directly, miraculously, in this world, in the affairs of men, and they simply failed to recognize it. I mentioned Paul a while ago, having an opportunity to look up into heaven. That's recorded in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Paul said in verse number 2, I knew a man in Christ above 14 years ago, whether in the body I cannot tell, or whether out of the body I cannot tell, God knoweth, such a one caught up into the third heaven, and I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I can't tell, God knows, how that he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words which it's not lawful for man to utter. He couldn't tell us what all he saw up there, but he did tell us that he saw that, what, what, was, um, what was there. God had given him a vision of what is to come so that he could preach to people. Many people today say, well, you know, if I could see something like that, then I would believe too. I mean, sure, you're going to believe if you can see it. But I haven't seen it, and I don't believe it. If you saw it, and you believed it, would you tell somebody about it? Would you expect them to believe you? Nobody likes to be disbelieved when he's telling something that he firmly knows to be the truth. Paul did just that. He saw it. And he's telling us, and yet we won't believe it. We are inconsistent, hypocritical people. But Paul said, I saw into heaven, there is such a place. He could not tell us what he saw, but there was another man who was allowed to see some of the same things, and perhaps even more, and he was specifically told to tell us what he saw, and that man was John. In the book of Revelation, the fourth chapter is a description of God in heaven. It's a relatively short chapter. Let's read the whole chapter together. Revelation chapter 4, verse number 1. I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was, as it were, of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. And immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. And he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone, and there was rainbow around about the throne, and sight like unto an emerald. And round about the throne were four and twenty seats, and upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting, clothed in white raiment, and they had on their heads crowns of gold. 
And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices, and there were, seen se there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was a sea of glass like unto crystal, and in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. And the first was like a lion, and the second like a calf, and the third had the face of a man, and the fourth was like a flying eagle. And the four beasts had each of them six wings about him, and they were full of eyes within, and they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. And when those beasts give glory to, and honor and thanks to him that sat on the throne who lives forever and ever, the four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne and worship him that liveth forever and ever, and cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for Thou hast created all things, and for Thy pleasure they are and were created. John said, That's what I saw. What does heaven look like? John could hardly give us a better description. Oh, he spoke in terms that we may not understand some of them. Well, what do you mean by this, or what do you mean by that, and who were those? But the picture is there. Does it really matter who they are and what some of those words mean? They paint a picture that is clear in the minds of all who read. Brother White told us at a gospel meeting a couple of weeks ago of a man that he knows, and I've heard the same thing, who said, singing holy, holy, holy all the time, praising God all day and all night. If that's all heaven is, I don't want to go there. I've heard people say that. And it's distressing. They simply don't know God, nor what it means to be a Christian. Here were people who knew God, who saw God, who were with God, and who could not help but praise Him. We need to spend more time getting to know who our Father is. You know, uh, people who are adopted don't know who their birth families were. Sometimes we go to great lengths of time and expense to find out who is my father, who is my mother. And we who have an invisible father who has given abundant evidence of himself ignore the evidence and don't try to seek him or understand him. There are many more statements of evidence, of course, in the scriptures. There are simple statements in the Bible, but powerful, powerful evidence because the Bible is provably the inspired Word of God. All these passages we've seen tonight are familiar to us, but look how they powerfully fit together and paint a consistent picture. The truth that there is life beyond the grave, there is a beautiful home for those who are faithful to God. You can trust God. You can trust God for the promise of heaven. You can trust God for the truth of eternal life. You can trust that God wants you to be there with him. You can trust that he has a place especially prepared for you. And you can trust the statement of God's plan for your salvation. God wants you to know the truth. He wants you to know every word that he has spoken. He wants you to understand who Jesus is, to believe that the Son, the eternal Son of God, eternal in heaven, put on flesh, came to earth, lived among men, was crucified, buried, rose again, and ascended back into heaven. He wants you to believe that Jesus is coming again. He wants you to believe that Jesus has given us a faith, a plan, a means to get into heaven, and a way to encourage one another along the way. And he has built his church in this world. And he wants you to repent from your sins. Follow after Jesus. Confess your faith in him every day of your life. Live for Jesus. If you haven't done so, be baptized into him. And if you have, continue to walk in newness of life. To which you were raised, Romans chapter 6 and verse number 4. Don't ever give up. Don't ever doubt. Don't ever distrust. God wants you to go to heaven with him. And if you're not on that road, we encourage you to repent and come back to him right now while we stand in